Welcome to Madison Street Baptist Church Online. We are not perfect people, but we have been rescued by a perfect Savior. Now, we exist to make disciples of Jesus. No matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus can heal your broken places. We are excited you are joining us today. Welcome to our time together. Um, always grateful for the opportunity uh, to open God's Word and open our hearts together. Uh, whether it's uh, together on campus, in person, or whether it's virtually, online, uh, what a great joy it is to, to have God's Word, to have God's Spirit, and to just open our hearts to see Him today. I'd ask you where you're at to grab a Bible. If you don't own a copy, then perhaps, you know, uh, Google search one and get a copy in front of you. We're going to be in Exodus chapters 3 and 4 today. So I'd ask you to open, open there with me. Uh, last week we started a new, uh, a new book, a new series. We're going to walk through the story of Exodus uh, to round out 2020. Uh, a story of hope and a story of redemption. And I pray that it's encouraging to you. Uh, I pray that it, it does produce a hope in our own hearts and, and even a longing in our own hearts to, to be with our God and to know Him intimately and affectionately. Uh, so we're going to be in Mos- or, uh, uh, Exodus 3 and 4 today. I want to read Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 10, just to start our time to get the Word in front of us and then pray and ask God for help. And, and then we'll spend our, our time together walking through these two chapters. So beginning in Exodus 3, Uh, Reading verses 7 through 10. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word, reveal to us your Son by the power of your Spirit and transform our hearts and our minds and our lives by your grace and by your goodness that we might be more like Jesus each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we start today, I would, I would ask a question. Uh, have you ever been asked to do something that seems impossible? Uh, have you ever been asked to do something that makes you uncomfortable? Uh, something that kind of gets in the way of your everyday, ordinary life. It kind of gets in the way. It's, it's, it's not something I really want to do. It's something I certainly didn't even think about doing, but the petition comes and you're forced to make a decision. Will you do it or not? Uh, in our text uh, last week, we saw how the Israelites were in Egypt and they're under immense oppression. And they're crying out to God. They're saying, we need help. Please help us. And, and God heard their cries, and he decided to act upon it, to move upon it, to, to rescue these people, to bring them out of slavery and to bring them into a new way of life, right? Like God's not only going to rescue them from the bad, he's going to rescue them for the good. And God's way of doing that is, is calling an ordinary, normal shepherd, a guy by the name of Moses. We were introduced to Moses last week, and remember, he's living in Midian, and he's got a wife and some children and a job and things seem to be going well. But God came and he called him. And he had to make a choice. Will he follow or not? Let's walk through this narrative together and see uh, the story of, of God's calling and commission. Beginning with verses 1 through 6, uh, we see that God personally called Moses. Moses was out one day, and he noticed a, an interesting sight. There was a bush that was burning, and it wasn't burning up. It was just this continual, self-sustaining burn, and that's pretty unusual. <laughs> that's not how it usually works. And so Moses is drawn to it. He's attracted to it, and he walks over to check it out. And when he gets there, he hears a voice coming out of, out of the burning bush, and it's, it's the voice of God. We're told in verses, uh, uh, verse 6 that it is the God of, of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is the one true God. And in verse 4, we see what God says to Moses. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Notice in this text that God did not call Moses from far off. Right? It wasn't a booming voice that came out of the clouds. It wasn't some uh, thing from the distance. But God actually came into Moses' space. Right? God came to where Moses was and presented himself, his presence, and this, as we said, this self-sustaining flame that this is the one true God. And he, and he calls Moses, he comes to Moses and he calls him personally. Notice that God doesn't say, hey you, or hey guy. He says, Moses, Moses. He calls him by name. This is a, an amazing picture of our God. Coming to Moses, coming to meet Moses where he was, and to call him by his, by his personal name. 
God personally called Moses. You know, when we think about our lives as, as followers of Jesus, you know, the same is true that Jesus personally called us. He personally called us. Right? The call to follow Jesus, the call to, to come to Jesus, is not this far off distant cry, but God invades our space. He comes to meet us where we are. When we get to the Gospels and we watch Jesus, He, he goes to where people are. To call them to himself. He, he goes to the sea, to, to, the, to the boats to call fishermen. He goes to the tax booth to call tax collectors. He, he goes to the well to call the, the woman from the well. He, he goes to where people are and he, and he presents himself and he says, come. In John chapter 10, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd and in verse 3, he says, The good shepherd calls his sheep by name. It's not some shotgun approach that Jesus makes when he calls people. It's an individual, effectual calling. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? To consider this for a moment, that where you are, if you are a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, he came to where we are. He met you where you were. He didn't say, hey, you need to come to me. He says, I'll come to you. And he called you by name. He knows your name. He knows your life. He knows your story. He knows all about you. And He called you by name. It's a personal calling. Our God is intimate with His people. And in this moment, we see God being intimate with Moses, coming to Moses' space and calling out Moses' name. Moses says, here I am. Here I am. And he approaches and he, he comes to hear from God. And, and God has something to say. God has something for Moses. And so second, as we continue the story, we see that God commissioned Moses. He, he personally commissioned Moses. In the text that we read just a moment ago, in verses 7 through 9, Moses is standing and he's, he's listening to God and God says, I heard the affliction of my people. I've seen their hardship. I've seen the affliction. I've seen their oppression. I know what's going on. I know things are bad and I am going to make things right. I'm going to rescue them out of this oppression. I'm going to rescue them out of this affliction and I'm going to bring them into a new way of life. And in verses 7 through 9, perhaps we're, we're thinking about Moses and he's saying, man, that sounds great. That's great, God. I'm glad that you're going to go and, and help them. That's great because they're, they're in a lot of problems. There's a lot of pain over there. That's, that's a great thing that you're going to do that. But God doesn't end by saying, I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to free them. I'm going to do these things. God looks at Moses. And in verse 10, he says, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, we stop for a moment and we consider Moses. Once again, he, he's living in Midian. He's been there for years. He's got a job. Right? In, in verse 1 of chapter 3, we see that Moses was a shepherd. He was taking care of sheep. He was taking care of a flock. It's not the most glamorous job. You know, he's not necessarily raking in the bucks, so to speak. But nonetheless, it's a job, something to do. There's some stability there. He's got a wife. He's got children. The text doesn't tell us that Moses was crying out, Lord, please send me. Lord, I want to help. It, Moses has got this regular, comfortable routine in his life. God steps into that moment. He says, listen, Moses, I'm going to go rescue these people, but I'm going to do that, and I'm going to interrupt your comfort zone. I'm going to interrupt your regular routine, and I want to use you. You're going to go and be, be my leader, be my voice, you're going to go bring these people out of this land. This is a difficult moment for Moses. And just as God commissioned Moses with a mission, so too we who have been called by Jesus personally have also been personally commissioned by Jesus. Right? Everybody who has been rescued or, or called by Jesus' mercy is at the same time commissioned into Jesus' mission. We see in Matthew 28 that Jesus says, I have all of the authority in heaven and on earth. I am the King of all kings. I am the Lord of all lords. There is none who has any rights above me. And looking down as the King, He says, 
This is what I'm calling you to do. This is what I'm commissioning you to do. He says, go make disciples. Make disciples. This is not an option for anyone who has been called by Jesus. It's, it's not a suggestion that the king is making. It is the commission for anyone and everyone who is a follower of Jesus. And just as Moses had a, a, had a routine, he had a pattern, he had a way of living that was perhaps even comfortable, we might look at the commission and say, well, man, I've, I've kind of got a way that I do things. I've, I've kind of got a, a way that I live. And making disciples wasn't necessarily a part of that. It wasn't something I was considering. And, and we might, like Moses, be like, well, I'm not sure that's necessarily comfortable for me. But we're reminded that the Great Commission isn't based on our comfort. It's based on our King. And he has said, this is what I'm calling you to do. This is what I'm commissioning you to do. Make disciples. You follow me well and help others follow me. This is what we all are called to do as followers. This is what I am called to do as a follower of Jesus, to love him, to help others love him, to, to follow him, to help others follow him. And this is the commission that we've been given and as a command, there's only two options, obedience and disobedience. Moses has an option at this moment. God says, I'm going to go rescue the Israelites, and I'm going to use you to do it. And Moses has an option to say, well, I'm not going to do that. And he tries to wiggle his, himself out of it. There's only two options, obedience and disobedience. What are we going to do? Now, Moses does what? many of us often would do in this story and often do today with the Great Commission, and that is he begins to present excuses, right? Excuses for why he should not go and why God should not use him. And we're going to see a pattern in these excuses, that, that all of Moses' excuses are really centered on himself and what he can accomplish on his own, and all of God's responses are going to center on himself, and on what God can do in and through Moses, right? God wants Moses to trust Him, right? Moses, don't look to yourself. Trust me. Now, the first excuse that Moses gives is, well, well, well who am I, right? Who am I? I I'm, a, I'm a shepherd in the middle of a field out in Midian. Like, I'm just an everyday ordinary, normal guy. I don't necessarily possess the skills of, of, a, of a leader, of a, of a redeemer, of somebody who's going to go lead people uh, out, of, out of slavery. I'm not necessarily some soldier. Like, who am I? And God responds in such a beautiful way, in such a beautiful fashion. He looks at Moses, and in verse 12, he says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Moses' initial excuse to try to get out of doing it is to say, I, I can't do that. And God says, you're right. But God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, when we think about the Great Commission, perhaps, perhaps that's your first thought is, well, how can I help somebody else follow Jesus? How can I help someone else love Jesus? Like, I, I'm just an everyday, ordinary person. I don't know all the inches. I don't have all the tools. I don't have all the resources. I, 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 I still make mistakes in my own life. I still do ugly things in my own days. Like, how can I do that? Who am I? And Jesus says, I am with you. This is the way the Great Commission ends in Matthew chapter 18, or 28, verse 20. He says, I am with you always. As you go and make disciples, know that I am with you. Our initial excuse to try to get out of it is met by the presence of God, by the presence of Jesus. He says, I'm with you. Moses tries to get out of it. God says, I'm giving you myself. And I would pray that as we consider making disciples, as our mission, our commissioning by our King, that we would stop and we would say, I can't, but you can. And all of our trust, all of our attention, all of our focus would be on Jesus working in and through us. Now Moses' second excuse is, well, what am I going to say? Right? Like, what am I going to say? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not that skilled. 
as a person, and I certainly don't even know what I'm going to say to these people. How am I going to go stand before Pharaoh? How am I going to go stand before Israel? Like, not only am I going to go try to convince Pharaoh to release the people, I've got to get them to follow me. Like, what am I going to say to the Israelites to even get them to listen to me and even follow me? And, and God responds. He says, I'm going to, I'll tell you what to say. He says, tell them who I am, tell them what I've seen, and tell them what I'm going to do. There's a promise that God is making. Tell them who I am. God says, tell them that I am who I am sends you. This amazing name, God himself, giving himself a name. I am who I am. Once again, simply that God is. He is. He is self-sustaining. He is all things. There is no creator who created him. He simply exists. He is. I am. God says, tell them that I am sent you and, and tell them that I am has seen their affliction. And in, 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 the, in the verse 16, I have observed you. I have seen where you're at. I see your pain. I see your suffering. I see your hurt. And I'm going to do something. Right, verse 17, I promise I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt. Moses, what should I say? God says, tell them who I am. Tell them that I've seen their affliction and give them my promise. I'm bringing you out. When we consider the Great Commission and we consider making disciples, I think the second thing we think of is, okay, what am I supposed to do? Like, what am I supposed to say? How do I make it? What, what, what's the content of discipleship? Jesus says, tell them who I am. Remember who he is, the King of glory. Preach the gospel. Come back to the gospel. He is the one who has lived the perfect life we were called to live and died the perfect death that we deserve to die and was resurrected on the third day, who has defeated our greatest fear and our greatest foe. Tell people who I am. Tell people what I have done. Tell people that I have seen them in their affliction. Isn't it a great comfort to know that God sees us in our hurt and He's moved by it? Tell people that we know Him and that He knows them and that He's moved by compassion. He's moved into action. And there's a promise that He's a healer. He's a rescuer. He's a redeemer. He's a restorer. He wants to bring us out of what is bad and, and bring us into what is good, right? It's not only that God's going to rescue the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. He's going to bring them into this new land. And so too, it's not just that God wants to get us out of the, the, the penalty of sin. He wants to bring us in, out of the power of sin, that we can live holy lives, good lives, obedient lives, walking in His truth and walking in His grace. Moses' first excuse was met by God's presence. And Moses' second excuse was met by God's promise. The same is true for us. Now, third, uh, Moses' Moses's third excuse, well, if they don't believe me. right? First excuse, who am I? Second excuse, what do I say? Third excuse, well, if they don't believe me. Well, if they don't believe what I'm saying. And God gives Moses some signs to use, right? If they don't believe what you're saying, uh, we'll first tell them, or first show them, you take, take your staff, you got this big wooden staff, just throw it on the ground, and it turns into a snake. And as it's a snake, grab it by the tail, and it'll turn back into a staff. That's a sign given by God to Moses. Presumably, it's to be done multiple times, not just once, but multiple times, and and we should note in that that God says to Moses, when it turns into a snake, to grab it by a tail. Now, I don't grab snakes anyway because I hate snakes, but I, I do know that you're not supposed to grab a snake by the tail. That's the most dangerous place to grab a snake. So consider this. Every time Moses performs this sign, he is stepping out on faith. Every time he bends down to grab that tail, he's stepping out in faith that God's going to come through and do what he promised. Now Moses says, well, what happens if they don't believe that? And God says, well, I'll give you a second sign. Put your hand in your cloak, and when you pull it out, it'll have leprosy on it. 
and then put it back in, pull it out, and it'll be healed. Here's a second sign from Moses. The third sign God gives Moses is he's going to turn the, the water in the Nile into blood, which is a foreshadow of what's going to happen in the, uh, in the plague narrative, as we'll get to later in the story. But God gives Moses these signs of his power, right? Um, you know, what if they don't believe me? God's saying, get them to see me. I'm the one with the power. Now, for you and I, as we are great commissioned disciples, we might say, what if people don't believe us? What if people don't believe me? God's given us a better sign. It's not just a staff turning into a snake or a hand with leprosy or a a river changing. Our greater sign is an empty tomb. The greatest sign of God's amazing power is that the tomb is still empty that the the King of glory actually rose from the dead. He's a resurrected Messiah. He's the resurrected Christ. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is now living and active in us. We have great power, not in and of ourselves, but in and of our God, in and of our King. As we move forward to be great commissioned people, to be disciples of Jesus, and we say, well, what if people don't believe us? What if people don't believe the message? Point them to the resurrection. Point them to Jesus. Help them see God's amazing power in our resurrected Messiah. Now Moses' fourth excuse, we get to uh, verse 10 in in chapter 4, is his speech. Moses says, you know, I I don't don't speak very well, right? Um, What happens if I'm stumbling or bumbling over my words? And uh, God says to Moses, um, he says, you know, listen, in verse 11, Who has made man's mouth? And who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Tony Marita offers some, I think, some great help on this text. Um, when, when Moses says uh, his excuses, God responds and he says, that your excuse is first irreverent and then irrelevant. Right? It's irreverent because God says, who do you think made your mouth? <laughs> Moses, who do you think created your mouth? Who do you think created you? Right? I created you, God says. That's my mouth. And for you to, set, to tell me that it's not going to work properly or do it, what I want it to do is irreverent because that's mine. And the second thing is God says it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant, Moses, because I'm going to put my words in you. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. You know, when we talk about making disciples, we say, I don't know what to say or I don't know how to say it. Listen, be reminded who designed you. Be reminded who created you. You are exactly the way God intended you to be. You know, so often we look at our characteristics, our personalities, we say, well, I can't make disciples because of this or because of that. I can't make disciples because I'm an introvert. And as an introvert, it's hard for me to communicate or talk. Listen, God designed us this way, if you're an introvert. Some of us are extroverts. I'm more of an introvert. God designed this way, right? And, and, and it's not an excuse to say, well, I'm an introvert. It's just how I am, so I can't make disciples. God says, don't you know who made you? It's irreverent to think that I can't use you. And to go on, reminded that, that Moses is told, God says, I'm going to put my words in your Mouth. Listen, all we got to do is open our mouths and trust that the Spirit of the living God is active in and through us. And God puts His words in His people's mouth. He speaks through them. Moses' excuses. Who am I? What do I say? Well, if they don't believe me, look, look at my inabilities, my poor quality. And God responds with each one of them saying, Listen, Moses, quit looking at yourself. Start looking at me. And the same is true for you and I in our commission to make disciples of Jesus. If we're sitting there making excuses for why we can't, Jesus is saying, quit looking at what you can do and start looking at what He can do, what I can do through you. Now, by God's grace alone, uh, Moses is given help. God says, I'm going to give you Aaron. He's your partner. And he can walk beside you and help you along the way. We're brought into this as a community Making disciples is a community event, working together, active together. We're not alone. God's given us His presence and His people. 
So let's make disciples together as a community of disciples, following Jesus together. Now this narrative comes to, to this, this close, and, and Moses is left with a decision, and Moses decides to, to go. And Moses went in, in, with his confidence in God. Right? Moses went with confidence in God. He comes back to his father-in-law, and he says to Jethro, he says, listen, I've got to go. I've got to go to Egypt. There's work to be done. And Jethro sends him on his way. And on his, even in verses 21 through 23, we see God continuing to tell Moses, listen, as you go, I'm glad you're going. This is great. We're going. You're going to go do this. You see, but God's telling Moses, listen, things might not go exactly the way you think. Right? Things might happen in a different way than you were expecting. God even tells Moses in this text that I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, which we will look at later in the narrative. But the point is, God, God's telling Moses, listen, don't focus on how things are going. Just remember, keep your eyes on me. I am with you every step of the way. Moses' confidence is in his God his confidence in what God's going to do. And even when things might be going wrong or, or, or poor, his confidence is to remain in his God. Now verses 24 through 26 are, to be honest, perhaps even weird to us at first when we read it. But I think there is great encouragement for you and I today when we come to verses 24 through 26. Uh, we see that, that, that God actually is and is all of a sudden out to get Moses. Because Moses' son uh, had not been circumcised. And so it's a problem. And Moses' wife zips in and, uh, and, and, and makes the correction uh, to pursue holiness in, in the household. And, and everything is, is okay. But here, here's a picture I want you to keep in front of you. God called Moses to go do this stuff. And even though Moses is, is going, even, even as Moses is going... He's still not perfect. He's still not living a perfectly sinless life. Right? He's, still, he's still making mistakes. He's still got some messiness. He's still got some ugliness. There's, there's still work to be done on Moses' own heart. But God uses everyday ordinary disciples, followers. And even when we still can be ugly and, and do some dumb things and and still not live holy lives or righteous lives, God can use us. He uses them here. So Aaron meets up with Moses, and the two of them go and talk to the Israelite elders, and they relay all that God has said. And something really great happens here. At the end of this chapter, in the chapter 4, verse 31, the people believed. They heard the message, and they believed that God was coming, God was helping. When they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that He had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. They bowed their heads and they worshipped. As we continue to talk about making disciples and, and, and being obedient to our commission, right? just as Moses went with his confidence and God, so too, we go with our confidence in Jesus, our confidence in Him. And when things don't go the way we thought, we keep our confidence on Him, our eyes fixed on Him. And, and when we have messy, ugly moments, we're reminded that He is still good. He is still faithful. And His grace is still sufficient. And as we connect the story of, of salvation and the story of redemption with others, we begin to see what's happening in this camp. That the goal of the commission and the goal of our commission is the worship of our God. To see people come alive. To see people turn from the things of this world, the filth of this world, and to worship the God who they were designed to worship, to engage in how they were designed to, to do, to be His people and to worship Him, to know that our God sees us in our affliction he sees us in our pain. He rescues our hearts so that we can worship Him and enjoy Him. There's nothing more liberating than worshiping our God in spirit 
and in truth. The goal of disciple making is the worship of King Jesus. So may we engage. May we make disciples. I pray that you and I as ordinary people, just like Moses, would, 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 would follow and participate in our commission. And as we, as we, as we end, as we, as we kind of land the plane today, I want to say this. Perhaps you're, you're, you're listening, you're watching, you're following, and, and we begin to ask this question and say, well, how do I make disciples? Right? Like, we're going to make disciples. This is our commissioning. The command by our God is to make disciples. And perhaps we're sitting and going, well, how do I make disciples? Well, I want to begin with just a couple of steps. The first two, I would say, to make disciples. And the first one is we've got to submit to the call. Right? Submit to the call. Just as Moses was called by God. He's called by God. We've been called by Jesus. And the call to follow Jesus, right? Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it's the call to come and die. Right? Jesus calls His people to, to deny themselves, to take up their cross daily and to, to come after Him, to, to follow Him. Do you know what it means to be called by Jesus? It's a submission to the king. He is the ruler. He is the reigner. He is the authority. You know, he is, Jesus is both savior and king. He is friend. He is king. And he's never one or the other. So often we, we, we want Jesus to be our savior. We want him to, to, to help us when we hurt, to get us out of hell. But as far as submitting to his authority... I said, well, Jesus, I don't really want you to, to change my life. I don't really want you to make things uncomfortable. I really don't want to, to, to do this stuff. I just want you to make my life easy. The call to follow Jesus is a call of submission. Submit to the King. Turn our allegiance to Him. And just as Moses says, here I am, our response is, here I am, command me. Here I am, command me. So the first part of, of making disciples is simply submitting to the King, submitting to Jesus. And second is surrendering to the call. Surrender to the, to, or surrender to the commission, excuse me. Surrender to the commission. Just as Moses was commissioned by God, I'm going to send you. Jesus commissions us. He sends us. And we have to begin by just surrendering. Saying, all right, I'm in. I'll go. I'll do. I'll surrender to the call. I want to make disciples. Send me, Lord. Surrender to it. Go all in, right? Uh, Jesus isn't looking for half-hearted disciples who are half-hearted in His commission. It's all. Let's go. And perhaps that's difficult for us, right? And perhaps even then we're, we're beginning to, to feel that pressure that Moses had to give excuses. I, I want to end with, um, end with this, right? Moses, once again, was an everyday ordinary guy who was commissioned by God. He was commissioned by God. He had, he had, he had a comfortable lifestyle, a comfortable living. His, he had every reason to not go, but God continually reaffirmed himself with Moses and refocused Moses as we surrender to the call to make disciples, let's continually fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's know that He's with us. Let's know that He is for us. Let's trust Him as we take each step day by day. May Christ be glorified as we engage in His mission to make much of Christ until we see Him. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we worship you and we, we pray, Lord, that more and more and more people would worship you. And Lord, we know that the way the gospel advances to the nations is through making disciples. And just as Moses was commissioned uh, to go into a, a, a difficult journey, so too, Lord, we, we acknowledge that making disciples it interrupts our, our daily routines. It interrupts our, our, our comfort, perhaps. It interrupts uh, some of the things that we had that we, we wanted to do. It, it comes in and, 
And Lord, I pray that those things would not stop us. I pray, Lord, you give us a fuller vision of who you are and that we would be a people who submit to the King and surrender to the call, and that we would gauge in your mission to make disciples who make disciples so that your worship would advance. I pray, Lord, for, for our church, that you would give us encouragement and wisdom, perseverance and faith, that you are with us and that you are for us every step of the way. I pray, Lord, for anyone who, is, who, who says, I don't really want to do that, God. I pray that you would convict their hearts, that we would see that this is a command given by our King, the resurrected Messiah, and that you would instead encourage us in this. You would show us your grace. You would show us your mercy. You would show us your love. That we would make much of you in our lives until we see you. We love you and we thank, we're so thankful that we love because you first loved us. And you show that love and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Help us to follow our sacrificial King in a lifestyle of sacrificial living. For your honor, for your glory, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. I pray uh, it was encouraging and challenging even as we think about the commission to go make disciples. 
If this is your first time joining us, I want to thank you for being a part of it. My name is Matt McKinney, and I serve as the pastor of Madison Street Baptist Church in Commerce, Georgia. And at our church, our mission is this. We exist to make disciples uh, by teaching and obeying God's Word for the praise and worship of King Jesus. If you want to learn more about our church, you can visit us online at www.madisonst.org. Uh, give us a call. Uh, shoot us an email if you want to talk more about Jesus or learn more about what it looks like to follow Him or to make disciples. Uh, it would be our, our joy just to love and serve your family any way we can. Uh, a few quick announcements. First, uh, last Sunday, we took up a love offering for our youth uh, for Fuge Camp. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the video uh, for what we collected, but I do want to say that it was very generous. And I just want to thank everyone who participated. Um, we want to be a church that reaches the next generation. And as we think about what that looks like, one of those ways is just simply investing in our youth. And uh, once again, just want to thank everyone who gave sacrificially. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a great, uh, great offering. And just want to encourage the church with that. Uh, if, if you want to learn more about it, you can call the church office. Uh, and ask and talk with Sue or somebody from the finance committee. But um, once again, just a great job. I want to just pat you on the back. It was, it was awesome. Uh, second announcement is, is we are at that time of year uh, where we begin uh, promoting and preparing for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, this, once again, is a simple way that we can make an impact around the world. Um, the boxes, I believe, are, are here and ready to be picked up. Uh, you can contact Sharon Hardy and the WMU uh, for more information. Uh, but uh, we're going to start promoting it. We want to we want to collect as many as we can. Uh, once again, you get a box, you get some of the items, toys that we can give, and, and just just love that we can share with children around the world who this Christmas might not have anything. Uh, an easy way to make an impact in the life of someone else uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ. So, let's give sacrificially. Uh, for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, give the church office a call. We'd be glad to help any way we can. Uh, know that, that we are praying for you, that we love you, that we're thinking about you. If there's anything that you need, uh, please uh, let us know. It would be our greatest joy uh, to serve your family any way we can. Uh, pray that this week is fruitful for you, and I pray that we will take some time today and throughout this week to prayerfully consider making disciples for the glory of Jesus Christ. Hope you have a great week. God bless. Thanks for joining us online today. If you would like more information, visit us at madisonst.org. If you have any questions or prayer concerns, you can always email us. We want commerce to know we are here for you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.